Thanks, Catherine. Thanks so much for making time to talk to me for our busy video vlogs today. It's a pleasure, Michaela. Great to be here. I know it's your day off, so thanks for making the time on a Friday afternoon. I think we live in very unusual times right now, so days off have become a thing that doesn't really exist anymore in my view. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. I, I do think that's another conversation. I think we need to do something about that. I'm worried about people not taking time off. So I'm going to keep this short and succinct with you. Catherine, you've been the CEO at Yakvik, the peak body for the Youth Affairs Council, since May last year. I don't know if I've told you this story, but when I was 14, I was on the Yakvik Executive Committee. So I'm really pleased that you're in that role and very pleased to be engaging with you in this. Prior to Yakvik, you spent six years based in London as the Director for Youth Affairs. Is that the right title? Director for Youth Affairs at the Commonwealth of Nations. Can you talk a bit about what that role was about? Sounds fascinating. It was actually fascinating. So my role was to lead the team that worked with the 53 governments of the Commonwealth, so countries in Africa, Asia, Pacific, Caribbean, around policy and programming for their young people. So there was advocacy work, but it was very much also working as a trusted advisor with governments to help them put young people at the centre of their policy making and their government's performance. That must have been an incredible experience, such a diverse group of stakeholders and cultures to be working across. So that would diverse. be incredible. Even, yeah. even in Africa, you know, there's 18 different countries from yeah. South Africa right through to Ghana. So incredibly different and all in different stages of development as well. And really interestingly also, some countries very, very uh, much embracing the idea that young people need to be participants and really have a voice, uh, and other countries very far behind in that thinking. And so actually part of what we did was bring countries together to share with each other so that they could help each other sort of improve their practice as well. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a bit more about that because I'm really curious about you have across your career had a really significant commitment to youth leadership, engagement, empowerment. You, prior to that, were the CEO at the Reach Foundation for five years. That's my first question, Catherine. What's your, what's your thinking about having worked for a significant part of your career in really being a leader in organisations that are all about helping empower young people to lead. Can you talk about what you think some of the most, what that has meant about your leadership and how you work as a leader? It's certainly been an ongoing learning experience for me. Certainly when I went to the REACH Foundation, which was the first time I was really working with young people, I used to say I had a vertical learning curve there because I came to appreciate, and I say this to people all the time now, the privilege of working with young people you get so much from their perspectives and their, the freshness and dynamism of the, of the way they work. Their perspectives are often unique. And so actually engaging in that environment every day is, is amazing. And when you can create platforms and resources and open up doors for young people to step up and lead, it's amazing what they achieve. So at the REACH Foundation, it was very much uh, designing and running the programs that we delivered for young people, but also then actually bringing young people in as spokespeople on, on different issues. When I was at the Commonwealth, we had these giant youth networks across the Commonwealth that were set up and led by young people focused on climate change, another one focused on human rights, on entrepreneurship, um, education and peace building. So these were young people who were leaders in their own country connecting up with young leaders right across the world. And we partnered with the UN on that too because they love the fact that we had all these leaders, young leaders from developing countries who had lived experience that they could bring but also incredibly informed about issues more broadly for young people. And that's actually something that we're doing at Yakvik now as well, really honouring the fact that young people have a right to be involved in any decision making that affects their lives. And quite often they're sort of cornered into um, kind of youth, what are considered youth issues. But if yes. you think about it, actually any issue is relevant to young people, whether you're talking about transport policy or you're talking about COVID-19 recovery or you're talking about bushfire recovery. And in fact, we're just about to start working with the bushfire recovery um, Victoria to support 
the community recovery committees in each of the towns and the young people in those bushfire affected areas to be putting their voices forward and really having a say on how their communities are rebuilt and what they envision for the future that will allow those communities to actually be built back better as well. So what would your advice be, given that what you're saying is just about any issue has an impact on young people and they have a contribution to make, what would your advice be to other sector leaders about young people's voice? Firstly, respect young people as experts in their own lives. So they may not be an expert on transport policy, but they are an expert in how they use transport and the issues that they face in not having adequate transport facilities, particularly if they live in rural and regional areas. So actually bringing young people into the conversation brings that perspective that's very um, useful and usually very authentic. Young people have no issue at all speaking truth to power. And in fact, yesterday we gave evidence at the parliamentary inquiry on homelessness and we had one of our young staff, I think he's 23 or 24, so under 25, which is the cutoff for young people, presenting the research that we'd done and the recommendations that young people in the consultations we ran had put forward, so four key recommendations around how to address homelessness for young people. But we also had a young person with lived experience of being homeless and telling her story and how it all came about. So actually putting those two young people's evidence together, it was really powerful. And at one point, one of the parliamentarians asked a question which was very leading and the young person with lived experience had no problem at all pushing straight back and saying, no, you're wrong. This is what the situation is. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas for other people, it's quite difficult in that kind of situation to be as honest and open. Absolutely. That's a fantastic story. What a great experience, Catherine. Catherine, when I was looking through, you know, your CV in preparation for this interview, I was really curious about you studied a lot at some really interesting places I'm very curious to hear you and we've we've talked a bit about your experience at the Kennedy School at Harvard can you share a bit about what that experience was like and how that's contributed to you as a leader Sure. I did the VAI um, strength survey some years ago, and, and it gives you all the 25 strengths in the order that they apply to you. And my top strength was curiosity about the world. My second strength was social justice. So I think it sort of explains what I've done in my life and where I, what I work on. And when I was at the Kennedy School, it honestly was probably the best year of my life. It was Such a great experience studying with 200 uh, in my particular cohort, people from right across the world. I was in a mid-career cohort, so they were all people who had seven years of work experience in public service in some way and most had a lot more. So uh, it was a real diversity of people from a massive diversity of countries and it was such a rich environment. And it was also an incredibly strong learning environment for me. And I think that the the time I spent there um, has actually been quite influential in how I worked when I was at the Commonwealth of Nations, because particularly when I was in Africa, you know, there's a lot of trauma from colonial times that has come through the generations. So as a white person going there to work, quite often I was the only white person in the room. And I was also seen as the authority figure coming from London. So I very quickly always established that I was Australian, not British, which helped a little bit. But still, you know, I had to work very much from an environment of being there to be, to help and develop the trust that would allow people to include me, let me help them basically, but very much respecting their right to make their decisions for their community and their government and their policy processes and things as well. And it really made me think about my own white privilege in that environment as well, when I was at the Commonwealth, but also when I was at Harvard. And I think a lot of what I learned during those times has been very helpful for me now in Australia Yakvik auspices the Koori Youth Council. So we have a big team of young Aboriginal people in our team. And, you know, obviously young Aboriginal people are a focus of our work. And so the Black Lives Matter movement is being quite a big part of our team's focus this year. I'm finding that I'm bringing the knowledge that I developed while I was at Harvard, studying with African students and other people of colour from from India and places like that. uh, And also the work I did at the Commonwealth has allowed me to bring a much better understanding to the importance of self-determination than I would have otherwise. And also a much greater understanding of 
what it means to people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds to see leaders from their own community stepping up and leading and also for people of colour. And just as an example, you know, when I was at Harvard, uh, I was actually there when Obama was elected president. And the night of the election, um, a group of us, we had a party at a, a bar at, to watch the election results come in. And at about eight o'clock that night, somebody said to me, oh, the, the, the black students for Obama are having a party down the road. So it was the Harvard Black Students Club. Um, we're having a party down the road. Do you want to go down there instead? And I was just said, sure. And so I went down there and I was actually in the room with all of the African-American students and other black students from Harvard at the moment when they called the election for Obama and it became clear. So I'm getting emotional now. It was just such an amazing moment to see what it meant to all of the people in that room to have a black man elected president in the United States. The joy, the tears, it was just extraordinary. It was an amazing memory, yeah. Seeing that and understanding that I think has really helped me. I mean, there's still so much for me to understand about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history and self-determination, but I think those experiences were definitely a big step forward for me in understanding that. What an incredible experience, Catherine, and what an incredible gift to be part of such an important moment in history. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much for sharing. This is a much longer conversation to be continued, Catherine. I'm very curious now about a whole range of other things, but hearing your reflections, particularly about insights from both of those, thinking about Black Lives Matters and self-determination and people with a lived experience's voice, being at the table and not only at the table but at the head of the table and the centre and being heard is incredibly powerful. So thank you very much for your time this afternoon. It's a pleasure, Michaela. Thank you.